Yo, what's going on, people? It's your boy, Poncho, and this is Cases Season 2, Episode 1, The Stefano Britzi Case. Just a little heads up for you guys expecting to see rap-related cases this season. That won't be until Season 3, which will more than likely be out towards the end of August or the start of September, so keep a lookout for that one in the near future. This season is surrounding cases that shocked the nation, so let's take a look at the Breaking Bad inspired murder case. So this case starts in the small town of San Marcello de Poetes, which is in the Tuscany region of Italy. On the 26th of June 1966, Stefano Brizzi was born into a devout Catholic family and would be the youngest of his siblings. Now, if you know anything about the Catholic religion, then you'll know that they're completely against gay people and Stefano Brizzi from the age of 15 years old knew that he was gay but could never come out to his family because he knew that it would hurt his parents and would more than likely not be accepted by them and what you've got to remember though that this was the 70s and 80s so it wasn't as accepted as it is today. A childhood friend of Britsy's told reporters years ago it was not easy to live freely without being judged for being gay. I remember Stefano was a very sensitive boy who could not find peace within himself. He was tormented. When Britsy was old enough, he went to university in the nearest big Italian city close to his little town, and that was Florence. He continued to study there and ended up graduating with a computer programming degree, and he continued to work in the field and ended up securing a job as a computer programmer and he would continue to work as one until he was in his 30s. In 2008, while he was in his early 40s, Stefano Brizzi would go on to be diagnosed with HIV and hepatitis C. In his own words, he was quoted as describing the diagnosis as a death sentence, but would take treatment to keep him healthy. And then in 2012, he was offered the chance to move to London to become a senior web developer for investment bank Morgan Stanley, in which his salary would have paid him £70,000 a year. Once moving to London and securing his £70,000 a year job, he would take a keen interest in the party scene and would try drugs such as GHB, for you guys who don't know, is a date rape drug, ketamine and crystal meth all for the first time. And out of all the drugs he was taking, he grew fond of crystal meth the most. After becoming a full-fledged addict, smoking crystal meth on a daily basis, Britsy would want a kick in the habit and he joined Crystal Meth Anonymous and he would also go to see a psychologist. In the months following his road to recovery, he finally sorted his addiction out, even going as far as making a funeral and putting meth in the coffin and burying it. Later though, he would become addicted again, and in his own words, Crystal Meth Anonymous and the psychologist were of no help. His addiction to Crystal Meth became that bad, he was eventually fired from his job. After losing his job and now addicted to Crystal Meth once again, it said that Britsy had gone from living the high life in London to a Crystal Meth addict who became a somewhat introvert, staying in his flat throughout the day, smoking Crystal Meth with the curtains closed. And his second addiction he developed while being an introvert next to Crystal Meth would be AMC's legendary TV show, Breaking Bad. I wonder why he liked that show so much. He also had turned to Satanism and had copies of the Satanic Bible on his computer with a notebook of handwritten notes addressed to the devil and he went on to explain that the psychologist had told him he developed psychosis because of the crystal meth but he believed that because he was raised as a Catholic and being gay was seen as evil he would go on to say that he was possessed by Satan himself. Although he had become a somewhat introvert though that wouldn't stop him using Grindr which is a gay dating app where gay people meet up for casual sex with each other and he became obsessed with chemsex parties and chemsex parties for you guys who don't know is basically where a group of people meet up they take drugs such as crystal meth and ketamine and then proceed to have sex for days he would do this throughout the majority of 2015 and the start of 2016 but then came april the 1st 2016 good morning i'm commander alison newcomb and i'm going to read a statement to you a man arrested on suspicion of murder remains in our custody and is being questioned by detectives from the Homicide and Major Crime Command. They have been leading the search to find missing Gordon PC Sample. This is obviously a significant development and we have informed Gordon's family and his colleagues. Gordon was reported missing on the 1st of April and we have working, working very hard to try and find him. Yesterday afternoon we were called by a member of the public to an address on the Peabody Estate in Southwark Street. At that address a man was arrested and human remains were discovered. Due to the condition of those human remains it will take some time for the cause of death to be established and for formal identification to take place. 
At this point, I do not wish to speculate on what has happened. Yesterday, a forensic search started at the address and it is ongoing. It will take some time for us to complete that work. It is a vital search for evidence. I would like to thank the local residents for their patience and support. Local officers are out on patrol to talk to residents and to reassure them. If there is anyone who can help us with our investigation, I would ask you to get in touch with us and to tell us what you know. My thoughts are with Gordon's family and friends at this personal time of tragedy and I would ask that they are given the space and privacy they need to come to terms with this development. This is a very sad day for Gordon's colleagues. There are many officers who have served with Gordon in London during his 30 year career who will acutely feel his loss. Thank you. On the 1st of April 2016, a Scottish man who had moved to Kent and worked for the Metropolitan Police, known as PC Gordon Semple, was at a meeting at the five-star Shangri-La Hotel at the Shard. He was on duty but in plain clothes and throughout the day would send multiple messages to people on Grindr asking to meet up to have no strings attached sex. Although Gordon had gone about messaging multiple people looking for, in his words, dirty and sleazy sex, he would at the same time bizarrely message his longtime partner Gary Meeks asking him what was for dinner later on that evening. Gordon would finally get a response on Grindr by none other than Stefano Brizzi. He's seen here travelling to Stefano Brizzi's home in the Peabody estate in Suffolk, little known to him that this would be his last journey that he would ever walk on. When he arrived at Britsy's home shortly after 3pm, it's thought that the two had engaged in sexual activities which consisted of rough sex, extreme domination and bondage. Around an hour later at 4pm, the two were back on Grinder, where it's believed that they wanted to set up a chemsex party and proceeded to message other men to join them. But as the evening fell, Gordon never returned home and Gary would start to worry. Worry would soon turn into panic though because five days had gone by since anyone had seen Gordon and at that point murder squad detectives had called in police divers to search the River Thames in search for Gordon. Six days after he had disappeared on April the 7th, police were called to the Peabody estate after it was reported that there was a bad smell coming from Britsy's flat. When police arrived, Gordon's cut up remains were found all over the house. Some body parts had been flushed down the toilet whilst a part of his body was left to dissolve in an acid bath. He would then go on to be arrested and would have to stand on trial for the murder of PC Gordon Semple in October later that year. So the trial would begin on the 20th of October 2016 and more details of what happened on the fateful Friday would emerge and it was heard that the Breaking Bad obsessed Stefano Brizzi was alleged to have killed PC Gordon Semple and dissolve his body in an acid bath after they both had organised a drug fueled sex party on Grinder. The court heard some of Gordon's remains were found dissolving in a bath of acid after police were alerted to a quote-unquote smell of death coming from his flat. Other parts were found in Britsy's bin and in the communal bins of the Peabody estate. One of Gordon's severed feet was found by a member of the public on the south side of the River Thames and attempts were also made to boil his flesh away in pans. When Britsy had originally been questioned by police, he had told them, I met him on Grinder and I killed him because Satan told me to. But in court, Britsy now claimed that Gordon was actually accidentally killed via strangulation during a sex game that went wrong. And jurors heard that Britsy was obsessed with Breaking Bad and that the body being dissolved in acid was him being inspired by the TV show because in various episodes different characters get rid of dead bodies in acid baths. Prosecutor Crispin A. Let QC warned jurors the nature of the evidence I'm afraid calls for strong stomachs as well as broad minds. I bet he was in a relationship Gordon Semple was a sexually promiscuous man who made extensive use of the gay app Grinder. Using Grinder, Mr. Semple would regularly meet strangers for sexual encounters. The sexual activity that followed might be of an extreme nature, 
domination, bondage, and much else besides, it's also the card that drugs were often involved. The court was then told that Britsy had messaged Gordon just after his meeting at the Shangri-La Hotel that he was free now for a hot, dirty, sleazy session. Over the next hour, both men used Grinder to invite other men for a drug fueled sex party. Only two men responded, one ultimately decided not to go because he had bad experiences with drugs or chemsex in the past. The other man, known only as CD to protect his identity, arrived at Britsy's flat just after 7pm. The court heard when he rang the bell, Britsy told him, we're having a situation here, someone fell ill but we're taking care of it so our party is cancelled. Police believe that there were only two people in the flat that being Gordon and Britsy and after piecing a timeline of events together along with the testimony of Britsy it was told that when CD had rang the doorbell Britsy was at that moment strangling Gordon to death. Although Britsy did claim that he was strangling Gordon with a dog collar in a game but the collar had snapped and he went on to lose his life. Mr Alec QC went on to say CD must have arrived at the very moment PC Semple was meeting his death inside. The court was then shown this CCTV footage of Britsy going to a DIY store to purchase a number of items including a set of saws and several large buckets. It was heard that after a few days since Gordon had gone missing, the neighbours had complained of an overwhelming smell that was coming from the flat. The caretaker of the block on the Peabody estate initially tried to mask the smell with bubblegum scented spray. When one neighbour knocked on the door to confront him about it, Britsy answered in nothing but his underpants and a pair of sunglasses and he told him, I'm sorry about the smell, I'm cooking for a friend. On the 7th of April, when police had been called about the smell, two policewomen had knocked on and Britsy had entered the door once again in just his underpants and a pair of sunglasses. When the door was opened, they were confronted by the overpowering smell of cleaning chemicals and rotting flesh. Upon entering the property, they found the acid bath which was filled with a blue-green liquid and, of course, Gordon's flesh was floating inside it. The bathroom floor was coated with slime as well as a number of coloured buckets on the floor and two black bin liners. It would be at that point Britsy would go on to tell them, I've tried to dissolve the body, I've killed a police officer and as previously stated when police asked him what happened he said, I killed him last week, I met him on Grinder and I killed him, Satan told me to. Continuing to search the flat they found bin liners which contained flesh, a human pelvis, a hand and part of a spine. As they carried on their search, Britsy told them he hadn't eaten all day and began eating a bread roll and started to drink a carton of milk. The prosecution went on to say the officer said that up until this time the defendant seemed calm and relatively composed. Now however he said I spoke to Satan and he was telling me to kill 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 and I agreed at the first opportunity. That led the officer to ask him if he had any problems with his mental health and the defendant said he used a lot of crystal meth but there was nothing apart from that. It was heard that further body parts were dumped into a sewer in Bermondsey and that the mixture in the bath was caustic soda and spiriting of salt containing 
hydrofluoric acid, but it wasn't powerful enough to dissolve the body. The prosecution said he said the chemicals needed to be heated at 300 degrees and he could not get them hot enough. He said that he had put what he described as the flabbery bit into the bucket in the bathroom. Britzi had then proceeded to try and flush the contents of the buckets down the toilet when the police had knocked on his door. At a further court date, it was told that Britzi told police that the murder was dictated to him while he was high on drugs, and he went on to say that four days had passed by and nobody had seen or said anything about Gordon dying, so he thought he was going to get away with it. And he also went on to tell them that he was going to finish the job, but because he was a quote-unquote very big man, he had got rid of most of it, but he had about two buckets left. He had also told police that he still had Gordon's head but had thrown the majority of the corpse in the river and when asked about the remaining body parts he replied ha good question I think there was a foot I think there might be a hand if you look at what's left over at home I think there's still a foot and a hand I believe there was a leg yes definitely there was a leg which I tried to roast as well but the head is still in my house although it's cracked the cranium is cracked but the chest was the hardest thing to crack he added that the buttocks had been very very fat and was really hard to decompose. Britzi said he had thrown some of the internal organs, including the intestines, the heart, the liver and the spleen in the river. He said he had flushed the lungs down the toilet and explained how he'd used a saw to cut up the corpse. He pointed out where he'd dumped the body on a map and told police, I kind of said goodbye. Luckily, I didn't know him. I thought it was a nice way to make a funeral on the River Thames. The prosecution went on to say, in dismembering Gordon's sample and disposing of some of the body parts, the defendant must have hoped at first to avoid being caught, and if that failed, that it would be impossible to identify how Gordon's sample had met his death. Nonetheless, from the body parts that were recovered, the pathologist has been able to identify bruising on the left side of the neck and the base of the tongue, which are associated with fractures in the structure of the neck. It was thought that Britzi had ate some of Gordon's sample, and the theory was, of course, in order to dispose of the body. Going into more depth about Britzi eating Gordon, forensic scientist Catherine King told the court she used luminol to expose bloodstains that Britzi had tried to scrub clean. The chemical revealed heavy blood staining around the oven and on the oven handle. She found a pool of fat and grease in the bottom of the oven which matched Gordon Semple's DNA. Miss King said she and a team had found Gordon Semple's DNA on Britzi's chopping board, a silver pot, and even in the blender, as well as on a set of chopsticks. It was also said that some red-brown matter matching Gordon Semple's DNA was also found in the sieve of a tea strainer, and that Britzi had apparently used sheets of metal that he bought from the hardware store to grate Gordon's flesh away from his body. The prosecution would go on to say, from human remains that were recovered from a bin in the kitchen, a pathologist identified a fragment of the chest wall. On one of the ribs, he found semicircular indentations, such as would raise the possibility as whether they were caused by a human. Britzi at a later court date claimed that he wasn't obsessed with Breaking Bad and in regards to the show he said, I remember in that episode Jesse doesn't use the right type of plastic for the bathtub and the bathtub gets eroded and the whole thing ends up on the floor. The prosecution would go on to say you knew perfectly well that it was hydrofluoric acid that was used in the program. Why was you so interested in the bucket you bought at Leyland, which was the hardware store? Did you want to make sure that you didn't make the same mistake that Walter White's sidekick Jesse did by by buying the wrong type of plastic and the whole thing dissolving and going through the floor. Were you living out your own episode of Breaking Bad in your own little flat in Suffolk? Britzi replied, I had a dead body and I had no idea what to do and I decided I wanted to dispose of it and I accept I'm guilty. I had no idea of how to dispose of it, I accept that I should have called the police. The prosecution repeated, do you accept you were living in an episode of Breaking Bad? He responded, I accept that at some point I considered without any rationality at all because there was nothing rational about it. I think I was inspired by that idea. Then, in November of 2016, after 30 hours of deliberation, Stefano Brizzi was found guilty of the murder of Gordon Semple by a majority of 10 to 2. But what should be noted is that the jury were told that they could have considered an alternative count of manslaughter instead. A month later, on the 12th of December 2016, he was then jailed to life with a minimum sentence of 24 years, with 7 years to run concurrent for obstructing a coroner. In passing sentencing, the judge went on to say terrible features of the case and that Britzi's drug addiction had ruined his life. He added, regret you express now for Mr. Semple's death has to be seen against what you did over a number of days to his body. He'd be sent to the infamous HMP Belmarsh, where two and a half months into his jail sentence, he'd be found hanging in his prison cell.
Stefano Brizzi had killed himself. Yes, Stefano Brizzi has been found dead here at Belmarsh, two months into a 24-year jail term. His sentence could have been even longer than that, as it was a life sentence, but with a minimum term of 24 years. Well, today, the Ministry of Justice said that the Belmarsh prisoner died here in custody yesterday. There are reports he may have taken his own life, but that has not been confirmed by the police. They say his death is being treated as unexplained. After an inquest into his suicide, it was heard that he'd hung himself in jail after he was taken off suicide watch because he was bored. At that inquest, it was heard that he was found suspended from a light fitting at 9.48am by prison staff. They attempted to resuscitate him, but Britsy was pronounced dead shortly after 10 past 10 in the morning. And that was the Stefano Brizzi case, a murder case which was inspired by an episode of Breaking Bad. Now, I remember following this case back in 2016 and when all the information had come out and how Gordon Semple had unfortunately died, I was absolutely baffled that somebody would use Breaking Bad as an inspiration for them to actually get rid of a dead body. Now again, people have probably put people in acid baths before, but the fact that he had actually watched Breaking Bad in order to do it completely flips it on its head and is absolutely mind-blowing that when you take drugs like crystal meth, that there's blurred lines between reality and TV shows. Now, I do want to take this time out just to say rest in peace to Gordon and my condolences go out to his family. But let me know what you guys think of this in the comment section below. Cases Season 2 is back again. We've got another nine episodes to go. And like I said at the start of the video, UK rap related cases will be back next season. This season, we're going to be sticking with cases that shock the nation. Give the video a little like. And if you want the latest drill, street and music news out of the UK, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. It's been your boy, Ape Poncho, and I'm out.